Welcome to session four of Build Your Own Interactive DSL. Today we talk about runtime system. We are at a point where we have defined a REPL, a parser, and an interpreter for our uh, interactive DSL. And today we look into how we can manage variables as a state, identify the main components of runtime system, and try to generalize our findings so that we can actually plug in uh, into our runtime whatever and, and our REPL whatever uh, DSL we want. If you recall from the last session, we have defined the state of our uh, Conway's Game of Life uh, system as a set of active cells on the grid. We've also wrapped this set into a Game of Life um, type uh, to make our life easier in terms of allowing us to modify the grid. And if you remember, we've uh, this, this uh, uh, implementation by itself gave us uh, a fairly natural way of implementing uh, and supporting commands like show, evolve, and applying patterns that are given in line by the user. What we haven't covered in the last session were commands that have to do with variables, in particular, uh, assigning a pattern to a variable and um, assigning a pattern to a set of cells uh, by referencing the, uh, by, by providing a variable reference. The reason why we were, we were not able to do so is that the state as, as it currently stands does not allow for uh, binding variables to patterns. So today we'll address that and expand our definition of state to include not only a game of life object that is uh, a representation of the of the grid, but also a dictionary that goes from a string representation of the of the variable name to the actual pattern that is represented by that uh, by that variable. And we will wrap these two fields into a state uh, type just to make again, our life easier and, and define signatures uh, on our functions that make much more sense. And with this um, with this implementation of a, a state data class, which includes a variables and a grid field, we'll be able to, on one hand, define variables uh, because thanks to the hash that uh, binds a string to a pattern, we'll be able to go to the variables field and add or overwrite a particular association between uh, string key and the pattern value. And on the other hand, we're also going to be able to apply patterns that are uh, not in line, but actually referenced by a variable. And we can we will be able to do that by looking up uh, a, the pattern uh, referenced by a variable in the variables object and then assigning that variable to the grid the same way we would do if the pattern was in line. You can look at the main um, file in our, in our repository and uh, uh, look at how we've evolved the state to account for the new for the extra field and if you go to the interpreter i just want to draw your attention on the fact that i've expanded the uh, clause around uh, the apply command and, and around the set var command nothing new on the set var command but i wanted to highlight how on the apply command we will figure out if we're dealing with a pattern or a variable a var variable name and if we are dealing with a variable name we will go and resolve the value of the uh, of the variable associated to the variable looking at the variables field, and then uh, treat the pattern uh, in the same way as we did before. It's interesting to notice that at this point, we can sometimes raise an exception if the variable has not been defined uh, before by the user. And this is a great uh, opportunity to remind ourselves why we are splitting, uh, parsing, and interpreting as, as two distinct operations. And one great reason is that uh, as soon as you require, it's important that your uh, interpreter knows about the state of your system. Well, the the moment it, parsing and interpreting altogether doesn't make sense anymore because in many ways, your parser shouldn't have to know or care about the state of your system. On the other hand, the interpreter, as we saw, uh, takes in the state itself uh, as one of the of the of the argument and so it has enough context to understand the semantics of the of the command um, as well as to actually act upon it and return a new version of the state so now that we've uh, uh, covered this let's look into the duties of a runtime system so there are three things that we want our runtime to uh, take care of one is to manage state the other one is to parse statement coming from user input. And the third one is to interpret commands. If you go back to our main file, you can notice that these are more or less the things that we are doing uh, inside the, the block we passed to the REPL. So what we'll do is we'll just extract this into a, 
some sort of runtime object which exposes a run uh, method and we'll define a class runtime it will just make it easy for us to initialize the runtime with a particular state and the state is going to be of type idle state and this will change this just changes things slightly for us because our runtime is going to be uh, an instance of runtime where we pass in the state uh, and that's and that's great and of course remember to also add the uh, prepend every in, uh, call to every instance of uh, uh, state in the in the code with with an at because now state is a um, an instance variable so now that we have this we can run our uh, parser again we can evolve the system we can assign a value to a variable then assign a pattern and evolve again and everything works as expected so we seem to have uh, nailed a first definition of runtime uh, there are a couple of uh, desirable features that i wanted to cover with you that i think you're going to enjoy the first one is about uh, making it so that the runtime can be initialized with pluggable components this is going to be extremely valuable on one hand when we want to test our code because we're going to be able to stop the functionality of the of the parser or the or the interpreter and as it is already the case inject a particular uh, state of the system so that we can evolve from the system from that point onward and then on the other hand it also makes it very easy for us to swap in different implementations of different uh, components of our runtime now state is already one thing that we plug into the constructor when we uh, initialize a runtime but that's not the case for parser and interpreter so let's go on and also par uh, pass in a parser to our to our initialize uh, method and what is the parser going to be about uh, what what is going to be the, the type of our parser well parser is just a function that takes a string and returns uh, a an eagle command in our in our particular case also rem remember that because we are relying on the parser combinator library parsec if the parser doesn't go uh, through if the parsing is not successful then we're going to get a parsec uh, error out of uh, parse error out of um, our um, our function call and that's uh, and that's something that we need to take into consideration when we when we pass in the parser now how does that how does this change our code where we well where we were calling I go dot parser dot parse we're actually going to now call at parser dot call and then pass in the input which slightly changes the way we initialize our runtime up here so we're going to define I'll, I'll make this in two steps because it's just a bit more convenient eagle.parser returns a new instance of our parser but what we're really interested in is the parser function which is uh, which we can uh, express in uh, um, in crystal as uh, as uh, um, a function signature propended by uh, a an arrow and this will uh, tell the compiler that we want to get a reference to the uh, parse function on the on the parser object and this is pretty convenient because we can now pass in uh, the parser and if we run our uh, run our our REPL again everything is working as expected the last bit we want to make pluggable is the interpreter what is the interpreter uh, you might uh, ask so the interpreter is just again a function that this time takes a state if you remember it's an eagle state and a command and return and returns what it returns a tuple in this case which contains the new state of the system and some sort of uh, feedback for the user uh, to uh, give them the uh, uh, some some feedback on how the the command uh, ran if it was successful or not and if we go down to the uh, run implementation we have to uh, replace this eagle interpret with something like at interpreter dot call and then state and command and again very briefly let's go and define the interpreter function as 
arrow interpret and again we have to specify the types of uh, of the argument of interpret so that uh, the compiler can figure out what we want it to do and in this case it's going to be i go state and i go command and again if we run this and pass in the interpreter to our runtime as well then we have again a working implementation of our uh, of our repo now this is uh, half half the fun in in uh, in some ways because if you think about it we've gone through uh, the effort of making it so that we can plug in different components uh, into our runtime but we it feels like we're kind of missing the trick here because we've uh, we've, go, we've gone up as far as making uh, each component pluggable but we are still tied to uh, the type of each particular um, uh, the, the types that are specific to the uh, interactive game of life. The question I have for you is, can we do any better? Can we generalize this? Well, the answer is yes, we can indeed make this uh, implementation of the runtime much more general. And in particular, we can make it completely uh, agnostic of the uh, types we are instantiating it with uh, in, uh, in this implementation. And the way we can do this is by relying on crystal generics and no matter which language you're coming from uh, you will more or less have a way of doing this uh, in your in your favorite language as well in our case things are going to be super easy because we're going to be going from uh, state command and uh, parsec parse error to generic types so no more eagle dot state uh, colon colon state but rather a generic type state we can do the same thing for eagle colon colon command. We can call this uh, cmd for command and replace any instance of eagle command with cmd. There's also one down here when we switch on the type of the command we just parsed. So this is going to become cmd. And again, this is a time per type parameter. And finally, let's not uh, let's not forget um, the uh, parsec parse error. This is super important because uh, the fact that we are now currently implementing our parser as a with parser combinator is completely um, uh, completely arbitrary and it might well be that we want to return a more specific error uh, when we when there's a, a parse issue uh, and it's also a good idea to also add a bit of a layer of abstraction between our code and uh, whatever library we are using underneath so very likely you don't want parsec to to show up to show up here so i can just uh, put in a generic error uh, type and say that we are passing this into uh, the run the runtime as so so if we look once again at our definition of the runtime there should be nothing in this definition that has anything to do with the interactive game of life we're working on and this should be hopefully a wow moment for you where you just written a handful of lines of code that are actually so generic that you can plug in whatever state, whatever parser, and whatever interpreter you want. Let's see this in action. In order to see this in action and show you that indeed we have uh, figured out a way of representing uh, a runtime that is general purpose, I defined a very tiny module defining its own DSL. It's, all, it's called counter. It defines a data class to wrap the state, which is just literally a count, uh, an integer. And then it defines a couple of operations, one that increments the counter and one that decreases the value of the counter. And um, it's, it's very simple. You can go through it. It's just 30 lines of code. And if I go back to our uh, main file, what I'm going to show you is that I can uh, kill everything related to eagle, require this uh, new counter module, then uh, keep state uh, parser function and um, interpreter function definition redefine them as a if I include counter then I can do counter state dot new and then a number and then I can do arrow counter dot parse string and then I can do counter dot interpret and so we go interpret on counter state 
and a command is an op an operation in this in this dsl uh, can it be the case that this is enough to plug in a completely different dsl into our implementation of runtime and repl let's uh, try and see oh well so the compiler is complaining and let's see what it has to say so there's no overload for runtime state command error again state cmd and error are our uh, generic uh, types and it seems to be um, blocked by the fact that it seems to be a bit confused about the uh, difference between error which is a parse error in our counter module and op now this can be um, fixed by just being a bit more explicit with the compiler so we'll just do the compiler a favor and say look the state is actually counter state the command is op and the error is er and if we try and run this again then we are inside the REPL where we can increment the value of the counter or decrement the value of the counter as we wish and I hope you are now convinced that we have a general purpose enough a runtime that uh, we are able to plug in any new state parser and interpreter and get uh, a um, fully fledged uh, runtime environment that we can run inside, inside our REPL which is uh, pretty much a success uh, by all means. And this uh, concludes our um, conversation about runtime. Tune in next week to uh, know a bit more about command line interfaces, 